My name is Ezra Vance, and this happened to me on October 12th, 2019. Sounds like the start of a bad horror flick, right? Fresh-faced government agent out of his depth stumbles upon something the locals have whispered about for generations. Well, sometimes the cliches exist for a reason. See, I wasn't your average suit-and-tie CIA analyst. I grew up in those woods, not the cutesy National Park kind, but the tangle of Appalachia where cell reception dies and old-timers still leave out salt for the things they refuse to name. Made me an odd fit for the Bureau, but when your cover story is local eccentric with an interest in unexplained phenomena, it helps to actually be a local eccentric. My assignment was simple enough. Investigate a rash of disappearances in and around West Virginia's Monongahela National Forest. Nothing new, mind you. Those woods have been swallowing folks for centuries. But there was a spike in cases, a pattern the higher-ups found. Interesting. My job was to determine if it was a threat worth their attention. Spoiler alert. Turns out it was. I started with the usual. Missing person reports, last known sightings, the standard investigative grind. Most leads petered out quickly, the kind of sad and mundane vanishings that happen in the wilderness. Then there was the Lewis case. Lewis, a seasoned hunter, vanished without a trace from a campsite littered with blood and scraps of fabric snagged high on the trees, as if something had ripped him apart well above ground level. That got my attention. With local law enforcement less than enthused about my fed-nosing-around routine, I went solo. Spent weeks in that forest, setting up motion-censored cameras, interviewing tight-lipped locals who eyed me with a mix of suspicion and pity. If the stories were true, I wasn't just hunting a predator, I was hunting a legend. The Skin Taker, some monstrous creature born out of campfire tales and backwoods paranoia. Days turned into nights and I found precisely nothing. No strange tracks, no unexplained camera triggers, just the gnawing feeling I was missing a piece of the puzzle. Then, on the edge of giving up, I made a rookie mistake. I got sloppy. Left my scent on gear, lingered too long in one spot. It saw me before I ever saw it. First, there was the sound. A rustling of leaves that shouldn't have been there, too quick and sharp for the wind then a whisper of movement in my peripheral vision, a flicker of something wrong. When I turned, it was hunched beneath a tangle of rhododendron branches watching me. Its size was deceptive at first. Low to the ground, its silhouette was almost canine. Then it stood, unfolding itself to an impossible height. Tree trunk limbs, fingers like gnarled roots, and a head. No words can do its head justice like a shattered, hollowed-out deer skull stretched over a vaguely human shape, filled with a writhing darkness. It let out a hissing sigh that raised the hair on my neck, a sound that didn't belong in the natural world. I fumbled for my rifle, terror battling with ingrained training. Yet the creature didn't charge. It tilted its ghastly head, those empty eye sockets seeming to bore into me. The wrongness of it, the sheer violation of everything I knew about biology, sent a wave of dizzying nausea through me. Then came the second sound. It tore my gaze upward to the canopy above. There, perched like monstrous crows, were two more of its kind. Their ragged forms were barely visible against the twilight, but I could hear their rasping breaths, smell the fetid stench of rotting leaves and wet earth that clung to them. That's when I broke. I don't mean I cried or fell to my knees though God knows I wanted to. I mean something inside me snapped, replaced by the cold clarity of pure survival instinct. I turned and ran, not in any planned direction, just blind, desperate flight. Branches whipped my face and tore at my clothes. I could hear them behind me, not the galumphing lope of a pursuing animal, but the quick, erratic scrabbling of too many legs. Once I tripped and fell, and for a heart-stopping second I swore I felt a twig-like hand brush against my boot before I scrambled upright again. I don't know how long I ran. Eventually I stumbled out onto a logging road, collapsing in a gasping heap. The creatures weren't there. Whether they lost interest or something else held them back, I'll never know. I made it back to civilization, filed a report so outlandish I'm surprised it didn't get me committed. The Lewis case is still open, my encounter dismissed as trauma-induced hallucination. Officially, the skin takers don't exist. Unofficially.
Well, there's a reason those agency desks looked so appealing after that. But sometimes at night, I still hear the rustle of leaves in the still city air, and I remember those empty eyes watching me from the darkness. My name is Marcus Barnes, and this happened to me in 2008. I'm what you could call a troubleshooter for the CIA, although the organization would strongly deny it. My work takes me places you won't find on a map. Abandoned Soviet outposts, hidden jungle strongholds, deep cover infiltration in major cities. And sometimes it takes me to sleepy corners of America, where things aren't as normal as they seem. My wife jokes I have a knack for finding trouble. Maybe she's right. This all started with a missing persons case in the heart of Ozark National Forest, Arkansas. Small town, dense woods, and a strange pattern of disappearances that didn't make sense. Animal attacks were possible, but the lack of remains was unsettling. The locals muttered about old legends, things in the darkness, but I'm a facts of the case type of guy. Hard evidence trumps tall tales. My partner for this gig was Sarah a field biologist with a sharp mind and a healthy dose of skepticism that mirrored my own. We started like any investigation, talking to the town, hiking the established trails, checking out areas where folks vanished. The forest felt normal at first, sunlight dappling through leaves, birdsong filling the air. I'd dealt with enough jungle warfare and urban chaos to appreciate that slice of Americana, but Sarah was the one with the relevant expertise out here. She pointed out odd breaks in vegetation, Strange tracks unlike any coyote or bear I'd seen, and an unsettling lack of small game. Things should be louder, she commented one afternoon as we surveyed a particularly silent patch of woods. Then came the break, a blurry image caught on a hunter's trail camera. It was misshapen, too lanky to be an ape, muzzle elongated like a dog, but wrong, with two wide eyes that reflected the flash. Sarah was stumped and even I couldn't shake the feeling that we weren't dealing with your average predator. We decided on a nighttime stakeout. Not regulation, but when the normal rules don't explain things, you adjust. Sarah rigged some motion sensors and IR cameras while I prepped gear. Mostly non-lethal, but I always have a backup plan involving bullets. That came from hard experience. The forest transformed as darkness fell. Sounds amplified rustling leaves, snapping twigs, and the shadows seemed to deepen, take on impossible shapes. We settled into position, backs against a tree, trying to blend in. That's when I saw it, a flicker of movement in the undergrowth. I nudged Sarah, pointing, but it was gone. Then, silence. Every instinct I had screamed wrong. You feel a predator's presence, even one you can't see. Perimeter sensor just tripped, Sarah whispered, her voice tense. Suddenly it was there. Not ten feet away, not the hulking monstrosity I'd half expected. It was streamlined, almost elegant in its awful way. Its body was wolfish but hairless, skin like stretched leather pulled over two sharp bones. Its eyes, those were what got to me, huge and luminous in the darkness, reflecting our own IR camera back at us. They held intelligence, a predatory hunger that chilled me to the core. My training kicked in. I reached for the tranquilizer gun, hoping to get a clean shot. Sarah aimed her camera, trying to get a better image of the thing. But we were too slow. With a speed that defied belief, the creature darted in. Sarah's camera was knocked flying, and then it was on her. I heard a shout, a feral snarl that wasn't quite animal and then she was dragged backwards into the inky blackness. I fired the trank gun, heard a muted thump. The creature paused, turning its luminous eyes towards me. For one heart-stopping moment, we just stared at each other across the clearing. Then it lowered its head, bared its teeth, a forest of needle-sharp incisors, gleaming even in the dim light, and charged. I sprinted, hearing twigs snap, the creature's ragged breathing too close for comfort. My mind raced. Sarah? Was she dead already? Did I dare stop, try to help, knowing that meant becoming the thing's next target? The path blurred beneath my feet. Every instinct told me to keep running, reach the truck, get a bigger gun, come back prepared. 
But another part of me, the part that couldn't live with myself if I abandoned Sarah, made me veer off course, back into the heart of that damned forest. I stumbled, crashed through bushes, the creature's snarls hot in my ears and growing closer. I risked a look back and saw those eyes in pursuit, glowing like twin embers. And then, Sarah's voice, a scream cut short. Adrenaline spiked through me. I ran faster than I had any right to, every step a gamble. The creature was toying with her. I knew it, drawing out the hunt. Fury battled with cold, analytical logic. Focus was my only weapon now. Then I saw them. Sarah slumped against a tree. The creature crouched beside her, sniffing her hair, testing her. I realized with a jolt, it wasn't feeding yet. Sarah was still alive. My chance. A gamble, but everything was at this point. I stopped, raising my hands trying to look non-threatening, a ridiculous gesture given the circumstances. Hey, I called out, my voice steady despite the terror pounding in my chest. Come after me, you ugly bastard. For a split second, the creature hesitated, its head tilted, those horrifying eyes assessing me. Then, with a snarl, it abandoned Sarah and turned on me. It moved like a shadow given form, like something born from nightmare fuel. But I was ready. I sprinted sideways, not towards the truck, but deeper into the woods. Every twist and turn of this terrain, I knew it from our recon. The creature was fast, but I was banking on something else. A stream. I'd seen it on the map, a swift, rocky bottom channel just a few hundred yards from our last position. My plan, flimsy as it was, hinged on getting there first. I risked another glance back and saw the creature lunging for the space I'd just been, its claws slashing empty air. A surge of hope, however desperate. Maybe I could outmaneuver it. I hit the stream with a splash that sent water spraying. The current was stronger than I expected. The rock slick beneath my boots. I stumbled, cursing, feeling clumsy compared to the fluid, sure movements of the thing pursuing me. I splashed across to the far bank, knowing that momentary delay bought me seconds, but seconds were all I had. The creature hesitated on the opposite shore. It sniffed the air, ears twitching, then paced along the river bank, looking for another crossing point. That was the crux of it. Water. Sarah had mentioned something about its tracks not going near wet ground. Was this some vulnerability I could exploit? Was it why it hadn't killed her outright? I didn't have time to analyze, just react. I ran downstream. The current tried to tug me, but I kept my footing, scrambling along the bank. I could hear the creature paralleling me, its growls echoing through the trees. Up ahead, a bend in the stream, and my last desperate hope. A fallen log spanning the water, creating a natural bridge. If I could cross that first... I pushed myself harder, fueled by fear and guilt, and a burning need to give Sarah even a slim chance. The log came into view, rotting, covered in moss, but it had to hold my weight for a few precious seconds. I didn't break stride, leaping onto its slippery surface, feeling it groan beneath me. I heard a splash. The creature had found another crossing point upstream. Now it was a race. I ran across the log, the rushing water a blur below me. On the far side I whirled, raising the trank gun. The creature emerged from the trees with a snarl, eyes blazing. I fired a shot. Two. One hit its shoulder, the other its flank. I didn't wait to see the effect. I turned and ran, crashing back into the dense cover of the forest. Behind me a roar of pain echoed, then silence. Had I slowed it down? Bought time? I didn't dare hope. I kept running, my lungs burning, legs threatening to give out. Only when the first fingers of dawn reached through the trees did I risk slowing down. I stumbled back to the truck, retrieved the satellite phone, and called for backup. It took hours for the team to arrive. They found Sarah first. She was alive, miraculously, but badly injured. Claw wounds, broken bones, and a concussion from being dragged. Something had played with her, tormented her. They found the creature, too. The trank darts hit home, but just slowed it down. It died near the stream, its snarling muzzle frozen in a rictus of rage. The biologists were baffled. They'd never seen anything like it. A predator perfectly evolved for this environment, yet eerily out of place. 
like something stepped out of the wrong evolutionary path. The incident was hushed up. Disappearance reports were altered, injuries blamed on bear attacks, the creature's body incinerated. The agency cleaned up the mess, as they always do. I saw Sarah through recovery. She didn't want to talk about it. Some horrors are better left unspoken. She left the field, moved out west, trying to rebuild her life. As for me, I asked for a reassignment. Got myself stationed on a remote outpost near the Arctic Circle. Cold suits me. It's simple. The enemies here are human, predictable. But at night, lying in my bunk, listening to the howling wind, sometimes I see those eyes glowing in the darkness. I wonder if the creature was one of a kind, or if there are others out there, lurking in the forgotten corners of the world. And I wonder, will they ever find me again? My name is Alex Porter, and this happened to me on February 21st, 1997. It was my first solo field assignment with the CIA. Well, solo in the loosest of terms. Being new to the Classified Operations Division, I still wasn't sure exactly what kind of rabbit hole they were sending me down, only that it all sounded a little too outlandish, even for us. My mission was to investigate a series of bizarre disappearances in and around the Okefenokee Swamp. Sprawling across the border between southeastern Georgia and northern Florida, the Okefenokee is one of the largest intact freshwater wetlands in the U.S., a primeval wilderness where legends of strange beasts and lost civilizations have echoed for centuries. I'd always been a skeptic, a rational man in a world that sometimes defied all reason. Still, I couldn't deny the growing sense of uneasiness gnawing at me as I made my way down to Hickox, a tiny town on the swamp's edge. Hickox was the kind of place you miss if you blink driving down the highway. A general store, a gas station, a worn-out diner with faded Coca-Cola signs. The kind of place where locals eye out-of-towners with a mix of curiosity and suspicion. I sought out the local sheriff, Sheriff Hank Bell. A bear of a man, Sheriff Bell had a face etched with deep lines that spoke of long, hard days, and maybe even longer nights. He greeted me with a drawl as slow and thick as molasses and a handshake that crushed my fingers. As expected, the sheriff was a man of few words. Ain't much to tell, Sheriff Bell said, leaning back in his creaky chair. Folks go missing. Hikers, the occasional hunter. Never turn up no trace, no scent. I asked him about the rumors, about local legends whispered around campfires. He dismissed them out of hand, just tall tales from a bored town. Still, there was a glint in his eye, a hesitation I couldn't quite place. After leaving the station, I decided to walk around town. Locals watched me from their porches, their stares lingering longer than what felt comfortable. I decided to try the diner, hoping to pick up some conversation, maybe a scrap of local gossip that the sheriff wouldn't share. Inside, the diner buzzed with a low hum of chatter, I took a seat at the counter and ordered some truly horrible coffee and a slice of apple pie that was surprisingly good. Next to me sat an old man with faded tattoos and a weathered cowboy hat. He seemed to be nursing the same cup of coffee he'd had when I walked in. After a couple of glances my way, he spoke, his voice hoarse. You that fella asking about the vanishings? I'm looking into it, I replied, keeping my response intentionally vague. The old man stared into the dark depths of his mug, his face unreadable. Ever hear tell of the swamp blower? He had my attention. Can't say I have. Most ain't, he muttered. Old folk story. Parents used to warn kids misbehaving, saying the swamp blower'd come get him in the night, snatched him up, never to be seen again. He leaned in closer, lowering his voice. Thing is, Sometimes even grown folk disappear folks what know these swamps better than their own backyard. He shrugged, his eyes clouded with something like fear. I thanked the old man, leaving my untouched coffee on the counter. Back at my motel that night I tried to write a report to find logic in all this. The missing person cases were few, spread out over decades. Could it all be explained by accidents, animal attacks, or deliberate vanishings? Sleep was a restless affair filled with strange, vivid dreams. Whispers of something moving in the shadows, a feeling of being watched by unseen eyes. 
It was hard to shake the image of the old man in the diner, the conviction in his voice. The next morning, I decided to get into the swamp myself to see firsthand what I was dealing with. I rented an old battered John boat from a bait shop and set off alone, armed only with a map, a compass, and the old man's unsettling story in my head. The deeper I ventured into the Oak Finoki, the more oppressive it felt. The air was still and humid, the dense tangle of cypress trees and lily pads closing in around me. The water was dark, reflecting the twisted branches like skeletal fingers reaching out from below. There was a primeval silence, broken only by the croaking of frogs and the relentless buzz of mosquitoes. Hours passed as I navigated the maze-like waterways. The sense I wasn't alone grew with each twist and turn of the boat. I swore I could hear rustling in the undergrowth, as if something just out of sight was paralleling my movements. Every rustle, every splash, sent a jolt of adrenaline through my system. Yet each time I turned my head, I saw nothing but the endless tangle of vegetation. With the sun starting its slow descent, I decided to head back. Turning the John boat around a particularly dense cluster of cypress, I suddenly recoiled. There, not ten feet away, was a face. Not a human face, though. It was broad and flattened, eyes set wide apart and bulging. Its mouth stretched in a wide grimace, revealing rows of jagged teeth. The skin was a mottled green-brown, textured like rough bark. The stench hit me next, a foul mix of rotting vegetation and stagnant water. Before I could process what I was seeing, the creature lunged. I barely had time to raise my arm before its claws ripped across my chest, sending a jolt of pain through my body. The creature's weight slammed into the boat, its momentum nearly capsizing us. I stumbled, my gun slipping from my grasp as I fought to regain my footing. The creature hissed, a sound like rusted nails against wet glass, before diving beneath the murky surface. Scrabbling in the bottom of the boat, I managed to retrieve my weapon and shakily aimed it at the water, heart pounding like a war drum against my ribs. The creature didn't resurface. I sat there, gasping for breath, unable to tear my gaze from the spot where it had disappeared. My arm throbbed and blood seeped through my torn shirt. The sun dipped below the tree line, casting long, ominous shadows across the swamp. I knew I needed to get out of there, to get back and report. Report what? Whatever that creature was, it could not be explained away. It didn't fit the profile of any known animal, of any local legend. The swamp blower of the old man's tales made real? It was crazy but a part of me clung to that ridiculous story as the only thing that made any sort of sense. Panic started to worm its way through my veins. I turned the boat, frantically working the small outboard motor, desperate to put as much distance between myself and that thing as I could. The air grew heavy, the sense of something watching me intensifying with each passing second. The ride back through the twilight was a blur of fear and adrenaline, Every snag in the water looked like the creature in my terror-fueled imagination. I had no idea if it was stalking me, waiting for the opportune moment to attack again. When I finally reached the dock, night had well and truly fallen, cloaking the swamp in impenetrable darkness. I stumbled back to my motel, clutching my injured arm and trying to rationalize what I had seen. No matter how I twisted the events, there was no way I could write this off as an animal attack. I cleaned my wounds as best I could and wrapped them with a ragged towel, ignoring the throbbing pain. I needed to report this, needed to warn the locals. I reached for the phone, but as I lifted the receiver, a sound echoed through the room. A scraping sound, a dragging sound coming from under my bed. Frozen in terror, I slowly lowered the receiver. The noise stopped. I waited, barely breathing, my heart pounding a frantic tattoo against my ribs. The scrape started again closer this time, followed by a low, guttural growl that sent ice down my spine. My vision swam as a wave of dizziness washed over me. I was going to die here, in this run-down motel room at the edge of the swamp, torn to pieces by some nightmare creature straight out of folklore. I thought of the missing persons, of the sheriff's haunted look, and the old man's whispered warnings in the diner. Then, a surge of anger cut through my fear. I wasn't going down without a fight. Grabbing the lamp from the bedside table, I slowly lowered myself to the floor, peering into the darkness. There it was. 
Its reptilian eyes glowed with a predatory gleam in the dim light filtering in from the bathroom. The creature's massive form was wedged halfway under the bed, and I watched in horrified fascination as it attempted to pull itself free. The muscles along its back rippled as it strained against the space, splintering the cheap wooden frame with a loud crack. I lunged forward, swinging the lamp with all my strength. It connected with the creature's head, sending it reeling back with a pained hiss. I swung again and again, driving it further back under the bed. There was a sudden tearing sound, followed by a shriek of pain that made my ears ring. Seizing the moment, I scrambled to my feet and sprinted for the door. I yanked it open, slammed it behind me, and ran. Bursting through the motel office, I desperately yelled for the man behind the desk. At first, there was only confused silence, and then a muffled boom like a gunshot, followed by a chilling bellow that shook the walls. I barely took shelter behind the front desk before the creature burst through the door, shattering the flimsy structure. There was another crash, and a scream cut short. The creature roared again, a sound of fury and pain. I knew then it wouldn't pursue me, not right away. Crouched on the dirty carpet, I could hear the sounds of destruction, the creature's enraged movements muffled by the flimsy walls. Sheriff Bell arrived within the hour, lights flashing and sirens wailing. When he and his men stormed in, weapons drawn, I heard more gunshots, followed by an eerie silence. Cautiously, they searched the wreckage of the room. When they finally emerged, the disbelief on their faces was almost comical. The body was gone. All that remained was a scattering of dark blood staining the carpet, an overturned bed, and a splintered doorway hanging off its hinges as a testament to the night's horrors. At the hospital, they stitched my wounds closed and gave me a hefty dose of painkillers. Sheriff Bell sat by my bed, staring off into the middle distance. He told me no one had believed him, that his reports about the missing persons, the strange circumstances, had been dismissed as the ramblings of a small-town lawman with an overactive imagination. "'I reckon I ain't the only one owes you an apology,' he said softly. His face was weathered and tired, like something essential had been carved out of him. When I was released from the hospital, they handed me a file. It was my case report, heavily redacted. The cause of the incident was officially listed as an unknown animal attack. The disappearance of the motel clerk was classified as a separate missing persons case. I knew my report, when it reached Langley, would be relegated to some forgotten archive, joining countless other unexplained encounters. I left Hickox the very same day, driving until the Okafenoki was nothing but a speck in my rearview mirror. In the years that followed, I took on different missions, saw my share of darkness in far-flung corners of the world. But the incident in the swamp lingered, a shadow I could never fully outrun. There would always be nights where I woke in a cold sweat, the reek of stagnant water heavy in the air, the piercing yellow eyes of the creature fresh in my mind. Sometimes I'd see news reports out of Georgia, unexplained disappearances on the edge of a vast wilderness, cases forever unsolved. I knew, without a doubt, that it was continuing its gruesome work in the depths of the Okafenoki. The aftermath is a quiet sort of haunting. I moved on with my life, got married, had a daughter, but a piece of me remains trapped back in that mosquito-infested swamp. I told myself in the beginning that the creature was an anomaly, some evolutionary aberration or undiscovered species. Over time, I've come to the chilling realization that might not be the whole truth. There were rumors in the agency, whispers about things lurking in remote corners of the earth. And sometimes, late at night when my daughter is fast asleep, I wonder how many more creatures like the Swamp Blower exist, hidden in the darkness, and how long it will be before they come out of the shadows. My name is Lucas Kane, and this happened to me on July 23rd, 2008. I'm an agent with the CIA, one of those guys who gets sent in when things get so weird even the regular agents wash their hands of it. Monsters like the one I encountered in the Everglades. Let's just say they don't make it into official briefings. The Everglades are a primordial place, a vast expanse of water, mangroves, and sun-bleached sawgrass stretching to the horizon. Alligators slide beneath the murky water, Exotic birds shriek overhead, and the air thrums with the buzz of a billion insects. 
a place designed to remind you just how small and insignificant humans are in the grand scheme of things. Officially, I was sent to investigate suspected eco-terrorism, poachers, smugglers, the usual swamp rats causing trouble. The reality? Well, that was far more disturbing. Locals were whispering about mutilated livestock, mangled beyond any known predator attack. And then there were the disappearances, hunters and hikers vanishing without a trace in the tangled waterways. Those vanishings sent a shiver down my spine, a prickle of unease the years of training couldn't fully suppress. I teamed up with a park ranger named Anya, a tough, sun-weathered woman with a no-nonsense attitude and a haunted look in her eyes. She'd grown up in the swamps, knew the territory like the back of her hand. Anya didn't believe in old wives' tales, but there was an edge to her voice when she relayed the chilling stories passed down by generations of her people. We spent most of a week combing through the swamp, finding nothing except oppressive heat and clouds of mosquitoes. Locals cast us wary glances, reluctant to break their code of silence about what lurked in the depths. Just when I was ready to chalk it up as another overblown conspiracy theory, we got our first solid lead. A hysterical family stumbled out of the mangroves, babbling about their fishing trip turned nightmare. Their boat was half-sunken, shredded as if clawed by some massive animal. More disturbing was their description of the creature they swore had attacked them, a hulking, amphibious beast with glowing eyes. After calming them down, Anya and I went to investigate. The boat was a wreck, just as they'd described. But it was the smell that hit me first, a rank, swampy odor overlaid with something sharp and metallic. Blood. Lots of it, staining the splintered wood. Whatever had attacked the boaters, it hadn't been an alligator. We set up camp at the edge of the sawgrass, Anya and I falling into a tense silence broken only by the croaking of frogs and the rustle of creatures unseen in the darkness. The feeling of being watched prickled the back of my neck. I knew instinctively that we were no longer the hunters, but the hunted. Nightfall transformed the swamp. Each rustle and splash seemed amplified, every shadow a potentially deadly threat. Then, just as the last light was draining from the sky, we heard it, a low, guttural growl that sent shivers down my spine. Anya and I exchanged a grim look. The hunt was on. We moved cautiously, flashlights cutting arcs through the gloom. The creature was stalking us, intelligent and patient. I caught glimpses of its movement in the underbrush, flashes of yellow eyes reflecting back the pale moonlight. Suddenly, it lunged from the mangroves, a monstrous eruption of scales and claws. Its size was staggering, easily twice the height of a man, and built like a tank. Its skin was leathery, mottled with shades of green and brown, camouflaging it perfectly in its environment. A massive, elongated snout ended in rows of razor-sharp teeth. Anya fired first, her rifle barking in the stillness. The creature seemed more annoyed than hurt, letting out a deafening roar that vibrated through the swamp. That roar was my first mistake. It drew attention. They came from the water, a whole pack of them. Sleek bodies slithered through the murky depths, glowing eyes fixed on us with predatory hunger. We were surrounded. Run! I shouted at Anya, knowing even as I said it that it was futile. The creatures hit us like a wave, claws tearing and teeth gnashing. Anya screamed, her gun clattering to the muddy ground. I fought back desperately, firing wildly into the thrashing bodies. One of the creatures latched onto my leg, its jaws crushing down on my calf. I screamed, the pain blinding, and kicked out frantically. Somehow I managed to scramble back, dragging my injured leg, leaving a trail of blood in my wake. Behind me I heard the sounds of Anya's struggle cut short with a sickening gurgle. There was no time for grief, only survival. I stumbled through the swamp, every instinct screaming at me to get out, to escape. The creatures pursued the sounds of their splashing growing closer. I could smell their fetid breath, hear their clicking claws on the roots and decaying vegetation. Any hope that I might outrun them was fading. I tripped, my bad leg giving out, and tumbled into the water. The shock of its surprising coldness momentarily cleared some of the pain-induced fog from my brain. Ahead, I saw the twisted, half-submerged roots of a massive mangrove. Desperate, I lunged for it, hauling myself into the tangle of branches. 
I clung to the mangrove roots, my breaths harsh and ragged in the swampy air. The creatures circled below, the water roiling with their movement. Their yellow eyes glinted up at me, burning with malevolent intelligence. They didn't seem inclined to follow me into the tangle of roots. Perhaps their size worked against them here. A small sliver of hope flickered in the crushing despair. My injured leg throbbed with agonizing intensity. I ripped a strip from my shirt and fashioned a crude tourniquet, gritting my teeth against waves of white-hot pain. If I didn't get out of here soon, infection or blood loss would finish what those monsters had started. The creatures, perhaps sensing my weakening state, grew bolder. One lunged forward, snapping its jaws just short of my dangling feet. Another attempted to scale the massive roots, only to slip back with an angry hiss. With a jolt of dread, I realized the water level was slowly rising. High tide. Soon my precarious refuge would be well within reach of those razor-sharp claws. Panic flared inside me, hot and blinding. I had to move, but where? The mangrove stood alone, an island amidst a vast expanse of water and sawgrass. Despair wrapped icy fingers around my heart. Then, through the haze of pain, I saw it, a flicker of light in the distance. Not the eerie glow of the creature's eyes, but a steady beam. A boat. Hope surged, hot and desperate. I cupped my hands around my mouth and shouted, my voice hoarse and weak against the vast emptiness of the swamp. The boat didn't change course. Either they hadn't heard or didn't care about some random yelling madman in the middle of nowhere. I shouted again, adding a desperate wave of my good arm. Still no response. Just as despair threatened to consume me again, the boat shifted course, turning slowly in my direction. Salvation. It took an agonizingly long time for the small airboat to reach me. Each minute felt like an hour, the creatures below growing more restless with every inch the water rose. I thought I heard gunfire, distant and muffled, followed by the fading echoes of those monstrous roars. Perhaps someone else was out there, buying me precious time. When the airboat finally drew close, two figures leaned over the edge. Hang tight, a burly bearded man yelled. We saw the whole thing. Damn swamp monsters. Relief washed over me so strong it nearly buckled my knees. I wasn't crazy. I wasn't alone. With their help, I managed to clamber aboard, collapsing in an exhausted heap. As the airboat sped away, I saw the mangrove sink below the waterline, the predators swarming over the last of my sanctuary. The aftermath was a blur. There were paramedics, a dingy field hospital, a whirlwind of official questions that I couldn't fully answer. They found Anya's remains, or what little the creatures had left of her. I never learned what happened to the boaters who helped rescue me. The official report chalked the whole thing up to a freak alligator attack, with my trauma-filled ramblings about a pack of monsters dismissed as hallucinations. I was medically discharged from the CIA. The gnawing ache in my leg is a constant reminder of that night, and my mangled calf might as well be branded with the truth the government will never acknowledge. Most nights I lie awake, the guttural roars of the creatures and Anya's dying screams echoing in my ears. Sleep offers no respite, only vivid nightmares of clawed hands dragging me back down into the murky depths. I moved into a high-rise apartment in the heart of a bustling city, steel and concrete, and as far from the natural world as I could get. I cover the windows with blackout blinds, never quite able to banish the feeling of those yellow eyes watching me from the darkness. Someone else at the agency took over my old case files, the ones that detail encounters too bizarre, too horrifying for the official records. Sometimes, I wonder if they found other victims, other survivors like me. Most times I push the thought away. It's safer not to know. The creatures of the Everglades still prowl their watery domain, unseen and unacknowledged by the wider world. And I, I survive. I exist. Some might even call it living. But I know the truth. The monsters are real. And one fateful, blood-soaked night, they left their mark on me, body and soul. Sometimes, late at night when the city seems to fall silent, I swear I can hear the distant rustling of the sawgrass and the soft splash of scaled bodies in the water. And I know it's only a matter of time until the swamp creatures come calling again.
My name is Dylan Carter, and this happened to me in the spring of 2014. I'm a CIA field agent, the job title a mask for far more shadowy dealings that the government would like to keep off official books. I'm the cleaner when diplomacy fails, when things get ugly, and they often do. Word came down that there was some rogue asset wreaking havoc in the remote parts of the Oregon wilderness, specifically a swath of dense forest nestled in the Cascade Range. It had all the markers of a classic op gone wrong, missing scientists, whispers of a classified project, and a whole lot of official silence about the why and how of it all. The flight there gave me way too much time to think. My wife and I, well, let's just say things were rocky. She hated the long hours, the disappearances, the lies. A regular, ordinary life, that was her constant refrain. Looking out the window at those endless clouds, I had to admit she wasn't wrong. I landed in a backwater town, all faded signs and closed storefronts. The rental truck I'd secured bounced its way down dirt roads until the trees closed in, a green-black wall blotting out the sky. My contact, Agent Monroe, was already set up in a remote hunter's cabin, old wood, flickering gaslights, and the lingering smell of mildew. "'You're not gonna like this,' was his greeting. He tossed a stack of files on the rickety table. Lab reports, half-burned notes, and some damn grainy photos that made the hair on my neck stand on end. It looked wrong. Like a twisted version of a bear, but too elongated. Eyes like dull embers. The muzzle a nightmare tangle of teeth. Monroe looked haggard. Shadows etched under his eyes. Locals claim it's got unnatural speed. Can disappear in a blink. We've lost three men already. Trackers sent in to find those scientists. They... Well, what they found wasn't fit for burial. We spent the next day prepping, hunting rifles with high-powered rounds, flashbangs, and enough tech to make my head spin. All the gadgets in the world wouldn't save us if this thing was as fast and feral as they said. Out here in these trees, it wasn't man versus beast. It was one predator against another. We tracked the creature for days. Its trail was a gruesome breadcrumb path of half-eaten animal carcasses, and the lingering stench of decay. The missing scientist's camp, when we found it, looked like a tornado had ripped through. Smashed tents, scattered equipment, and a whole lot of blood sprayed haphazardly across the forest floor. One thing became abundantly clear. This wasn't some escaped lab experiment. This thing was a hunter, intelligent and cruel. It stalked us in return, a presence in the rustling leaves, the eerie silence that descended when the birds stopped singing. We set the trap in a clearing, a deer carcass wired with sensors, us hunkered down in the brush, waiting for the predator to take the bait. Night fell, heavy and oppressive. We took shifts, scanning the tree line until my eyes burned. And then, movement. Not a lumbering gait, but a silent, fluid ripple, like darkness itself had gained form. The deer carcass jerked, wires sparking as they snapped. It was so fast, just a blur of motion and snarls as it tore into the flesh. That's when we unleashed hell. Flashbangs exploded, the sudden burst of light and sound disorienting the creature, buying us precious seconds. Monroe and I opened fire. It howled, a piercing shriek that echoed through the ancient trees. I got a clean shot at its shoulder. It staggered, then lunged at Monroe. He went down in a tangle of limbs and claws, his scream cutting off abruptly. I didn't hesitate, didn't think, just emptied my gun, my bullet slamming into the creature's back. It reared up, roaring, and finally, I saw it clearly. Those eyes, glowing amber in the dim light, the stretched skull-like head, the tendons pulling tight across its emaciated form. It twisted its long body, fixing its glowing gaze on me. In that moment, I felt a primal terror, an instinctive certainty that I was next on the menu. Then, abruptly, the creature spun around and bolted back into the impenetrable darkness of the forest. I stumbled back, gasping for breath, Monroe's blood hot on my hands. My ears were ringing from the gunshots, the stench of cordite and burnt fur choking the air. I had to move, get out of this kill zone. I grabbed Monroe's rifle, fumbling with the unfamiliar weight of it as I retreated deeper into the trees. Stumbling onward felt like wading through quicksand. 
Every rustle of leaves, every snapped twig set off a surge of adrenaline in my veins. My mind conjured up that loping, skeletal shape stalking me, the glowing eyes watching from the shadows. I came to a gurgling creek and sloshed through the icy water, the shock of it numbing my ragged nerves and forcing a haze of clarity back into my brain. The moon had broken through the cloud cover, painting the world in shades of monochrome. I had no idea where the hell I was, no compass, and a flickering suspicion that my GPS tracker would be useless out here. By daybreak, the forest felt different, less sinister but still unnervingly silent. I found a deer trail and followed it, keeping my eyes peeled for any sign of the creature. Part of me wanted to run, leave civilization far behind, but I couldn't. There was a job to finish, and a flicker of guilt over Monroe's death adding fuel to my rage. Late afternoon, I saw it, a flicker of unnatural movement on a ridge high above me. The creature was perched on a rocky outcrop, its emaciated silhouette sharp against the setting sun. It wasn't tracking me, but watching, as if surveying its territory. That flicker of arrogance, that casual indifference, ignited something in me. It wasn't just a dangerous beast anymore. It was a mockery of everything I stood for. A threat, not only to me, but to anyone unlucky enough to stumble into its hunting grounds. Taking a deep breath, I raised Monroe's rifle, siding in on that impossibly long body. The first shot echoed through the valley. The creature jolted, its head snapping around. I fired a second time before it could pinpoint my location. This time, I heard a yelp of pain as my bullet tore through its flesh. It scrambled up the ridge, disappearing behind a tangle of boulders. I moved, skirting the base of the ridge, keeping out of sight but ready. There was blood on the rocks a trail leading deeper into the mountains. The setting sun cast long shadows, turning any scrubby bush or rock formation into a grotesque, monstrous shape. I'd traded places with my prey. I was the hunter now. Following the blood trail wasn't easy. It twisted and turned, sometimes vanishing entirely, only to reappear on a patch of moss or a fallen tree. The forest was growing denser, the light fading with each step. Then the ground fell away, a sharp incline leading down towards a shadowed crevice. That's where I found its lair, a shallow cave carved into the bedrock. The stench that reached me was almost unbearable, a mix of rotting meat and something cloyingly sweet that turned my stomach. The cave opening was narrow, barely big enough for a person to crawl through on their belly. I hesitated, my hand gripping the flashlight taped to the rifle's barrel. To go in there was madness, suicide, that creature could be waiting just out of sight, ready to ambush me. But Monroe's bloodied face flashed before my eyes, hardening my resolve. This thing had caused enough death. I dropped to my knees, edged into the darkness, and flicked on the light. The beam cut through the gloom, revealing piles of half-eaten carcasses, deer, some kind of mountain goat, and... My breath hitched. Two human bodies, stripped to bone and yellowed teeth, lay discarded in the corner. The scientists... Something lunged at me from the darkness. I twisted, firing a shot instinctively. The bullet ripped through the creature's shoulder, sending it crashing against the cave wall. Its roar shook the stones above, and a shower of dust and debris rained down. I scrambled backward, blind in the sudden darkness after the flashlight flew from my hand. The creature screeched, scrambling around in the tight space, claws scrabbling against rock. I couldn't risk another shot, not in this enclosed cave. The echo or a ricochet could be just as lethal. It came again, a rush of claws and fetid breath. I grabbed the rifle barrel, using it to block a raking blow, feeling the vibration of those impossibly long claws through the steel. Somehow I managed to roll, slamming the butt of the rifle into the ground. The cave roof buckled, stones tumbling down, one of them striking the creature square on its skeletal head. It roared, a deafening wounded sound and thrashed wildly. I took my chance, slithering past it and out into the last sliver of twilight. I ran. I scrambled up the incline, not stopping until the sound of the creature's thrashing faded into the distance. When I finally collapsed against a tree, chest heaving, my body one giant bruise, I felt the full weight of what I'd just survived. It took me another day to navigate my way out of the mountains, back to civilization. The local authorities barely believed my mangled story when I finally flagged down a passing car. But somehow they found the cave, the evidence of the creature's kills. 
Some men in suits, a different branch of the government, I suspected, came and carted it all off. Case closed, creature contained, or so they told me. They offered the standard spiel relocation, new identity, a quiet life on a beach somewhere. I refused. I got back on that plane, went home to my wife, who looked at me with haunted eyes and a weariness that mirrored my own. We never really spoke about what happened. What do you even say? Some nights I jolt awake in a cold sweat, the image of that skeletal thing, those glowing eyes searing my brain. My wife tells me I talk in my sleep, growl like a wounded animal. The truth is, part of me stayed back there in that forest. The part that wasn't afraid to become a monster to fight a monster. My name is Rowan Ellis, and this happened to me in October of 2012. I never talk about this, ever. But hell, it's been nagging me like a rotten tooth for too long now. Maybe putting words to it will give me some peace. See, I wasn't always some fancy CIA office monkey. Started out in field ops, did a bunch of stuff I can't and won't mention. I liked the action back then, the adrenaline. Kind of like an addiction, if I'm being honest. Got injured in a mission gone wrong, though. Messed up my knee, nothing surgery couldn't fix, but enough to put me off the front lines. Turns out, I'm a decent analyst. That's how I landed up in the X Division. Sounds like a bad sci-fi movie, doesn't it? X Division. Nope, we don't deal with aliens or mutant monsters. The weird stuff that happens is all too human. Cults, serial killers with some occult ritual angle, that sort of thing. Mostly we debunk cases, tell the locals their demon sightings are just junkies tweaking. Sometimes, though, sometimes things don't add up. That's how I found myself stuck in the Ozark National Forest. Small town called Mountain View. Classic rural America. Church potlucks. Nosy neighbors. The works. They had a rash of disappearances. Hikers, hunters, gone without a trace. No bodies, no signs of struggle. Cops figured they just got lost in the woods. That happens. But the numbers seemed too high especially for these parts. So I got sent. I spent weeks there, hunkered down in a cheap motel on the edge of town, tramped through those woods, talked to the locals. The locals were... different. Not unfriendly, just guarded. They watched me, whispered behind my back, that old town mistrust of strangers mixed with... something else. I put it down to small town jitters fueled by paranoia. Should have listened to my gut first few days it was quiet. Too quiet. The woods were silent. No birdsong, no rustle of squirrels. It felt heavy, oppressive. One night I was out late doing a solo recon pass and I swear I felt eyes on me. Not human eyes. Hair stood up on the back of my neck. I drew my gun, swept the beam of my flashlight around. Nothing. I chalked it down to too much bad coffee and overactive imagination. Then two nights later, I saw it. I was walking back to the motel and something moved in the shadows. It was huge, lumbering. I froze, hand on my weapon. For a second I thought it was a bear until I saw the shape clearly. Long, spindly legs, too many legs, a segmented body the size of a deer carcass. I couldn't make out a head in the gloom, just a sense of something alien and wrong. And then, it vanished. Went back to my motel room, trembling, poured myself a drink then another. It was the isolation, I told myself. The creepiness of the town. I just needed some sleep. The next morning I was determined to put the night before behind me. Found out the next day there was another disappearance. This time it wasn't a hiker, but someone local. An old man named Jebediah Carter. His cabin was up in the hills, near where I thought I had seen that thing. I teamed up with a state trooper, a grizzled veteran called Hank. Hank didn't look too happy about a fed poking around his territory. But hey, orders were orders. We headed out to Carter's cabin. Place was a dump. We didn't find much, just a half-eaten bowl of oatmeal and an old shotgun leaning by the door. But outside, near the back of the cabin, that's where things turned sour. I spotted something on the ground. Hank came over. What the hell is that? He said. I didn't answer. I knew. It was a leg. 
Carter's leg, I thought. But it wasn't asterisk human asterisk. It was segmented, tipped with a barbed claw like an insect's leg, but way bigger. Yellowish goo dripped from the severed point where it must have been torn off. We pressed deeper into the woods, the sunlight barely filtering through the canopy of leaves. The forest floor was a tangle of rotting vegetation and roots, making our progress slow. Up ahead I heard a crash of branches and a sickening, tearing sound. Silence fell. Christ, one of the agents, a guy named Cooper, whispered. What did it get? We didn't have long to wait for an answer. A mangled shape hurtled toward us through the undergrowth. It was Thompson, another agent. His leg was gone and his screams echoed through the woods. Then it pounced, the creature a blur of segmented limbs and glinting black. One swipe of a claw sent Thompson sprawling. We fired, emptying our clips into the monstrosity. It screeched, a high-pitched, unnatural sound that sent shivers down my spine. But our bullets seemed to do little more than annoy it. Hank was yelling, urging us to fall back as the creature lunged. I saw a flicker of movement, then a net dropped over it, electrified, meant to stun it. The creature thrashed, but the shocks brought it down. We swarmed in, agents holding tasers. For a moment it seemed like we had it contained. Then it changed. Its segmented body seemed to ripple and flow, growing, stretching. The head became visible now, a mass of eyes and twitching mandibles. Its legs split and doubled, then doubled again. It burst out of the net, a grotesque tower of chitin and malice. Cooper shouted a warning, but it was too late. The creature's claws snatched him, dragging him toward its yawning maw. There was a wet, crunching sound, followed by a gurgle as his screams abruptly ended. It dropped his mutilated body and turned its focus on us. We ran. There's no shame in admitting it. We ran like hell. Hank, bless his old heart, covered our retreat, firing his shotgun, buying us precious seconds. The sound of the creature crashing through the trees in pursuit spurred us on. I heard a choked cry behind me. Hank was down, his face pale. He managed to raise an arm, toss me something. Detonator! Get to the clearing, he shouted, before the creature was on him. I didn't look back. I sprinted through the trees, clutching the detonator like a lifeline. Behind me, the crash of trees and Hank's final scream faded. I burst out of the woods and kept running blindly across open ground towards where the team had left their vehicles. Reaching the SUV, I fumbled for the keys, my fingers trembling. The thing I knew was gaining on me. I glanced back and saw it emerge from the tree line, towering and terrible. There wasn't time. I hit the detonator. The explosion echoed through the valley. I was thrown backward, shielded my eyes against the fiery blast. When the ringing in my ears subsided, I looked back. The edge of the forest was ablaze, a wall of flames between me and whatever that thing was. Rescue came later. More agents, local law enforcement, the works. What was left of the team regrouped. We concocted a story, the usual sanitized cover-up. Animal attack, freak accident with explosives. Just enough to smooth things over with the locals and prevent a mass panic. In the official report, Hank and the others were listed as casualties. I got some medals, the kind they give out for exceptional valor, which stuck in my throat like a fishbone. Every time I close my eyes, I see that creature and hear Hank's last desperate shout, I still have nightmares, see those gleaming eyes, those monstrous twitching limbs reaching for me through the shadows. I retired from field work after that, took a desk job, pushing papers in some air-conditioned DC office. I try not to think about the Ozark Mountains, or the thing that still lurks in the depths of those woods. But I know it's out there, waiting, growing. And if what happened in that small town was just the beginning, God help us all. The aftermath, the true horror, lies not just in the deaths of good men, but in the unsettling truth that brushed against the edges of our world that day. I saw something that shouldn't exist, a creature of nightmares, a dark stain on the very fabric of reality. And there are others, others like it, lurking unseen. It's a knowledge that gnaws at me, a chilling whisper in the back of my mind. The Mountain View incident didn't end that day. It merely transformed. The horror didn't die in the flames. It spread outwards, an insidious infection of the ordinary world. Sometimes, in the quiet of the night, 
I swear I feel the woods creeping closer. The trees outside my apartment window, they just don't seem quite right. The rustling of leaves, the creak of branches, it sounds like a chorus of chittering limbs, a symphony of alien hunger. And I know that this isn't over, not by a long shot. The real battle is yet to come. Hank was staring at me, demanding answers. I didn't have any. Instead, I reached for my radio, called for backup. We got something real strange out here, I said into the mic, my voice tight. Took a while for the team to arrive. Hank and I stood there in the damp clearing, the silence broken only by the dripping of the strange yellow goo, Jebediah's blood, or whatever it was. In the back of my mind, I knew it was waiting, watching us from the trees. They arrived, four agents armed and armored. We went into those woods sweeping in formation. It felt like a bad B-movie, some sci-fi flick with laughable dialogue, Creature from the Deep Woods, or some equally cringeworthy title. And then, I saw it again. It scuttled, low to the ground, moving through the trees with impossible speed. One of the agents shouted, fired a shot. I think he got a hit, but it didn't slow down. It leapt over a fallen log and vanished into the green gloom. We gave chase. We pressed deeper into the woods, the sunlight barely filtering through the canopy of leaves. The forest floor was a tangle of rotting vegetation and roots, making our progress slow. Up ahead, I heard a crash of branches and a sickening tearing sound. Silence fell. Christ, one of the agents, a guy named Cooper, whispered. What did it get? We didn't have long to wait for an answer. A mangled shape hurtled toward us through the undergrowth. It was Thompson, another agent. His leg was gone and his screams echoed through the woods. Then it pounced. The creature, a blur of segmented limbs and glinting black. One swipe of a claw sent Thompson sprawling. We fired, emptying our clips into the monstrosity. It screeched, a high-pitched, unnatural sound that sent shivers down my spine. But our bullets seemed to do little more than annoy it. Hank was yelling, urging us to fall back as the creature lunged. I saw a flicker of movement, then a net dropped over it. Electrified, meant to stun it. The creature thrashed, but the shocks brought it down. We swarmed in, agents holding tasers. For a moment, it seemed like we had it contained. Then it changed. Its segmented body seemed to ripple and flow, growing, stretching. The head became visible now, a mass of eyes and twitching mandibles. Its legs split and doubled, then doubled again. It burst out of the net, a grotesque tower of chitin and malice. Cooper shouted a warning, but it was too late. The creature's claws snatched him, dragging him toward its yawning maw. There was a wet, crunching sound, followed by a gurgle as his screams abruptly ended. It dropped his mutilated body and turned its focus on us. We ran. There's no shame in admitting it. We ran like hell. Hank, bless his old heart, covered our retreat, firing his shotgun, buying us precious seconds. The sound of the creature crashing through the trees in pursuit spurred us on. I heard a choked cry behind me. Hank was down, his face pale. He managed to raise an arm, toss me something. Detonator! Get to the clearing! He shouted, before the creature was on him. I didn't look back. I sprinted through the trees, clutching the detonator like a lifeline. Behind me, the crash of trees and Hank's final scream faded. I burst out of the woods and kept running blindly across open ground towards where the team had left their vehicles. Reaching the SUV, I fumbled for the keys, my fingers trembling. The thing I knew was gaining on me. I glanced back and saw it emerge from the tree line, towering and terrible. There wasn't time. I hit the detonator. The explosion echoed through the valley. I was thrown backward, shielded my eyes against the fiery blast. When the ringing in my ears subsided, I looked back. The edge of the forest was ablaze, a wall of flames between me and whatever that thing was. Rescue came later. More agents, local law enforcement, the works. What was left of the team regrouped. We concocted a story, the usual sanitized cover-up. Animal attack, freak accident with explosives, just enough to smooth things over with the locals and prevent a mass panic. In the official report, Hank and the others were listed as casualties. I got some medals, the kind they give out for exceptional valor, which stuck in my throat like a fishbone. Every time I close my eyes, I see that creature and hear Hank's last desperate shout. 
I still have nightmares. See those gleaming eyes, those monstrous twitching limbs reaching for me through the shadows. I retired from fieldwork after that. Took a desk job pushing papers in some air-conditioned D.C. office. I try not to think about the Ozark Mountains, or the thing that still lurks in the depths of those woods. But I know it's out there, waiting, growing. And if what happened in that small town was just the beginning, God help us all. The aftermath, the true horror, lies not just in the deaths of good men, but in the unsettling truth that brushed against the edges of our world that day. I saw something that shouldn't exist, a creature of nightmares, a dark stain on the very fabric of reality. And there are others, others like it, lurking unseen. It's a knowledge that gnaws at me, a chilling whisper in the back of my mind. The Mountain View incident didn't end that day, it merely transformed. The horror didn't die in the flames. It spread outwards, an insidious infection of the ordinary world. Sometimes, in the quiet of the night, I swear I feel the woods creeping closer. The trees outside my apartment window, they just don't seem quite right. The rustling of leaves, the creak of branches. It sounds like a chorus of chittering limbs, a symphony of alien hunger. And I know that this isn't over, not by a long shot. The real battle is yet to come.